son of Jaca, an oracle. This man declared to Ithiel, to Ithiel and to Ukal, I am the most ignorant of men. I do not have a man's understanding. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. Who has gone up to the heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in the hollow of his hands? Who has wrapped up the waters in his cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and the name of his son? Tell me if you know. Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. There are three things, uh, verse 18, there are three things that are too amazing for me, four that I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a maiden. This is the way of an adulteress. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. Under three things the earth trembles. Under four it cannot bear up. A servant who becomes king, a fool who is full of food, an unloved woman who is married, and a maidservant who displaces her mistress. Those are our readings for this morning, the wisdom of God. Let's ask God to help us understand these difficult passages. Almighty God, we come this morning asking you to speak to us through your word. Your words are perfect, as this passage itself says. And we need to learn from your words. Humble us, soften us, and give us understanding. And then give us courage and wisdom to apply your words into our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. For his glory, the glory of your church, for the advance of your mission here on earth, and for your eternal glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are coming now to the end of our Summer of Wisdom series. Pastor Dennis uh, will preach next Sunday a final sermon on Ecclesiastes. He's been going through Ecclesiastes this summer. And today and two Sundays from now, we will start to conclude the book of Proverbs. I was kind of cheating. I'm taking two sermons to try to close, and Pastor Dennis has to do it in one. He's got more experience. He can handle it. Um, But Proverbs chapter 30 is the beginning of the conclusion of Proverbs. We're probably very familiar with the very end of Proverbs, right? The, The woman of wisdom, the wife of noble character, Um, And uh, I think that my tentative plan two weeks from now is to step into that passage and see what it has, why it closes the book of Proverbs. But this is the beginning of the conclusion of the book of Proverbs. And it's kind of surprising that these are the words that conclude the book of Proverbs. That God, in his wisdom, chose these words of Agur, apparently a non-Israelite, who expresses humility and calls himself the most ignorant of men and the listeners so the listeners to proverbs the readers of proverbs are called to join in these words we too must say after reading and studying and pondering and learning from proverbs when we get to the end of the book this is what we're supposed to say i have not learned wisdom nor have i knowledge of the holy one Does that seem surprising? At the end of a course on physics or cooking or electrical, most of us are looking for some kind of certificate, right? Or a degree. We want something that says that we have learned. Maybe that we've even mastered a subject that says you are now qualified. But at the end of Proverbs, the wisest student must say with Agur, I do not have a man's understanding. How can that be true? Perhaps because wisdom is uh, wisdom becomes aware of the awesomeness of God faster than wisdom can understand the awesomeness of God. Wisdom becomes aware of the awesomeness of God faster than we can understand God. 
Maybe wisdom is like chipping a hole in a dam. Imagine you went to the bottom of a big dam and you were chipping a hole into it, hoping to get a drink. But the little refreshing stream you imagine quickly becomes like a blasting torrent. Maybe you're blasted off your feet. Maybe you're blinded by the spray of water. You aren't thinking about a drink anymore. Now you're starting to worry about drowning. That's what wisdom is like. The more wisdom you gain, the more overwhelming it is. The more you must say with agar, I don't know anything. So Agur says this. He recognizes that the more you know God, the more you know there is to know. The more you know God, the more you realize you do not know. So at the end of it all, Agur is not actually saying he knows nothing, but rather he is no longer willing to boast in human understanding. He's no, no longer willing to call his feeble understanding wisdom. He is so awed by the Holy One, he dares not call the little he knows knowledge. Agur emphasizes that human beings can't comprehend God. You know, who has gone up to the heavens and come down? Who has gathered the wind in the hollow of his hands? Who has wrapped up the waters in his cloak? Who established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and the name of his son? Tell me if you know. The answer is no one. You can't name anyone who's done all that. Human beings don't come and go from heaven. We can't climb to heaven. And if we somehow arrive there, how would we get back? Human beings can't grab the wind. Human beings can't contain the water of the earth. Bagger looked at creation, and he looked at God, and he saw the infinite power and might of God beyond comprehension. Another way of summarizing what Agur experienced is with that W word, wonder. He experienced wonder. Last week, we considered the wisdom of doubt. Yes, There is wisdom in doubt. There's wisdom in rejecting self-confidence. And what the Proverbs encouraged us to do is to seek counsel and advice and God's word. So you're looking to listen. There's a wisdom of doubt and humility. Now, it's closely related, but we see that one of the most important pieces of wisdom is wonder, the wisdom of wonder. Agar expresses That wonder in the introduction to chapter 30b, he also expresses it in some of these Proverbs, and we've chosen a couple of them, or I've chosen a couple. Look at 30 verses 18 through 19. He says, there are three things that are too amazing for me, four that I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a maiden. This proverb is a numerical proverb. These uh, a three plus one proverb. And this is a kind of common type of proverb that they had in, the, uh, in Hebrew wisdom and I think also in just the broader ancient Near East. But generally this kind of three plus one proverb is a way of emphasizing the last point. So you're going to say four things and you want to put stress on the last one. So you say there's three things that are something and four that are even more. There's three things that are too amazing for me. Four that I do not understand. The first three are very obviously considering creation. That's sort of more outside of man and mankind. Uh, And considering ways of motion in creation. We have sky, earth, and sea. Those are the, the places that God made. And then we have the eagle in the sky and the snake on the rock or the earth and a ship in the sea. Have you ever watched a bird or maybe an eagle soaring through the sky? Flight is amazing. I, I think it was our own John McConnell, and I'm not sure if we're streaming on Facebook and it's probably like midnight or something, but I know the McConnell sometimes watch afterwards, so John, I hope this is your story. But uh, I think it was John who told me when I asked him about flying, because He's a pilot. He flies for Samaritan's Purse now. And he told me that even after, as a pilot, studying all the physics and the, the mechanics of flying and how it all works, and there's a certain logic to it and a science, 
wings and lift and forces and all that, he said it, that flying still amazes him. It still is a wonder that this big hunk of metal is going to lift up and somehow hang in the air. It's wonderful. Or have you ever seen a snake slither? Maybe you were terrified and you went screaming the other direction so you didn't see very long. But if you had the time to look at a snake, the way they move is pretty amazing. It's mesmerizing and it doesn't look real. And you see the snake, especially the agar seems to have chosen to describe a snake on a rock because that's even more amazing. It has nothing to grab onto. It doesn't even have toes or fingers or legs. And yet it seems to effortlessly move along, sometimes very quickly. That's wonderful or amazing. And what about a ship on the high sea? I love water. I love riding, uh, being in a boat on the water. And if I do get a chance to be uh, in a boat, there's not a lot of lakes around here, but I've spent some time on lakes. Maybe you have. We can go out in the ocean, maybe. But uh, isn't it amazing, that feeling of gliding along the water? If you've experienced that feeling, you've had that sense of awe, like it's another universe out here, it's a whole other way of moving. Uh, that's the wonder that Agar was describing. Putting it all together, Agar was amazed by these different ways of moving, and he was amazed, more importantly, he was amazed by the wisdom and power of God who designed them. And then comes this three plus one, the final proverb, the final piece of it, where the emphasis falls, the way of a man with a maiden. Agar wasn't the first man to have trouble understanding the way of a man with a woman, and he wasn't the last. Poets throughout human history have expressed wonder at the mysteries of human love, at the wonders and mysteries and difficulty of understanding human attraction, hard to predict, hard to understand. How is it that a man and a woman can feel like they were made for each other? or that somehow they complete each other. Every couple has a story, and they have uh, a story of love and affection for one another that often defies logic, defies understanding. Love can change the whole course of a man or a woman's life. It leads to vows. It leads to two becoming one. It leads to a new family. This mysterious way of a man and a maiden is surely one of the most powerful forces in creation. It is amazing and wonderful. And that's what amazed Agur. It was wonderful because it is designed by God. God created love, affection, marriage, and sexual intimacy between a husband and wife. And all of that was for Agur more amazing and wonderful and difficult to comprehend than all these wonders he saw in creation. But what makes this observation of Agur divine wisdom instead of just Hallmark Channel mush? And what makes this worth knowing, worth thinking about? I think the answer comes from taking this 3 plus 1 proverb and combining it with that opening sense of wonder and humility at the beginning of chapter 30. And I believe the point is something like this when we put it together. If we look out at creation and we see things we don't understand, and if we can look at the most foundational relationship of human beings, that of husband and wife, and even there we must confess that it's too wonderful for us to fully comprehend, that we don't fully understand how that all works. If that is, if even our own way is too difficult for us to fully comprehend, then we need to humbly seek our Creator's wisdom and guidance for human life. If we don't fully understand ourselves and our God-given ways, what makes us think we can live based on our own understanding? Proverbs 20, verse 24 says, A man's steps are directed by the Lord. How then can anyone understand his own way? How do we understand what we're supposed to do as human beings? By knowing the God who created our way. 
So that sense of wonder should drive us to humbly seek guidance in all areas of human life. One of the reasons our world is filled with so much misery and frustration and brokenness is that instead of having the wisdom to wonder, human beings have the foolishness to proudly think we know everything and we can do whatever we want with God's designs. Agar provides a picture here of what it looks like when human beings do not wonder as they should. In verse 20, this is the way of an adulteress. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. What a contrast. This wise man, Agar, confesses that the creator's design of human love and marriage and intimacy is too wonderful for him. But the adulteress treats this relationship as nothing more than eating. And she believes she has done nothing wrong, even though she is willfully breaking and violating God's created design. Wisdom and wonder would say, you don't know what you're doing. Wisdom and wonder would say, you don't understand the seriousness. Wisdom and wonder would say, you can't possibly understand the consequences. Who knows what it does to the human soul to play with human relationships and sexual intimacy so flippantly, to treat divinely ordained institutions like marriage so irreverently? Who knows? I'm not sure I know, but I think we all feel some of the effects of that in our lives, in our world, in our sin. But it is what our society is doing, isn't it? Especially with marriage and sexuality and gender. Our society is flippant, foolish, even proud. Proudly messing with things that we can't fully understand. You know, to so much of that goes on in culture around us, sometimes Christians get very loud and proud and angry, and I don't think that's the solution. We shouldn't be loud and arrogant toward the world. That might make us become foolish too. Instead, we need to show the world our own wonder and reverence before God's created designs. We don't have to claim to know everything. But we do maintain that only God knows everything and he is the creator. Let's take something like transgenderism. I don't know how best to treat and help boys and girls and men and women who have deep confusion and brokenness and uncertainty regarding their identity and their gender. And yes, they do. And yes, it's very real. And it's horrible and difficult. Our world has a whole bunch of ideas about what to do with that. I don't claim to know exactly how to handle all those situations. I don't claim to know everything about what it means to be male and female or all the mysteries of marriage or the way that God is designed. But that's the point. We don't know. We wonder. And so we should be very, very hesitant to mess with God's designs to mess with things we cannot fully understand. That's what Proverbs is telling us. To humble ourselves before God, to seek his word, his wisdom, his guidance for our human lives. Sometimes to follow his ways when we don't understand them because he knows a lot more than we do and we don't even know our own ways. Agar uses another three plus one proverb here to emphasize that even seemingly small violations of God's created order are very serious. Look at verses 21 to 23. Under three things the earth trembles. Under four it cannot bear up. A servant who becomes king, a fool who is full of food, an unloved woman who is married, and a maidservant who displaces her mistress. Agar describes four situations that violate the design of creation, and he says they are so serious that the earth shakes, whether from discomfort with the situation or because the earth feels the tremors of God's, uh, God's designs being broken or maybe feels the, you know, what's the opposite of an aftershock? The shocks that come before judgment. I don't know what the imagery is exactly why the earth would trouble, but something's going on. Let's go through these four really quickly. A servant who becomes king. This isn't a feel-good story like 
Joseph in Egypt where a good and qualified slave becomes a high ruler. This is describing a servant who is an official who is supposed to be loyal to the king and instead usurps the throne. We can only imagine through lies and violence and betrayal. And he takes what is not his. He takes what he's not qualified for. The scriptures teach that government and leadership in human society is instituted by God. That leadership, I'm going to, I think scripturally we have to disagree with the Declaration of Independence a little bit here and say that leadership does not derive its authority solely from the consent of the governed. Leadership ultimately derives its authority from God, who is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and ruler over presidents and governors and mayors and everyone else. So what happens when this servant betrays his loyalty to this God-given authority, he is breaking something divinely created. And the Bible says it's like an earthquake. The next one, a fool who is full of food. You might think, doesn't sound so bad. So we got a fool who's got a full belly, what's the problem? But a fool shouldn't be full of food. Food should come from hard work, from diligence, from living as God created us to. And hunger has a purpose too. Hunger is designed to help correct and encourage the fool to change his ways. But what happens if foolishness is re being rewarded in a society? Then something has gone wrong in God's created order. Human beings have turned things upside down. We are rewarding what is bad, probably discouraging what is good. This isn't saying that we, of course, this isn't saying that a food bank should ask people if they're worthy before they feed them or something. This is not saying that at all. What it is saying is that when the normal order of doing the right thing leads to positive results gets turned upside down in society because people are becoming corrupt, because our values are all distorted, then God's created design for human beings is being violated. No wonder the earth trembles. Or an unloved woman who is married. Now this one probably doesn't mean what it sounds like. And I think probably all of us here, or most of us, will hear this as saying, what a tragedy it is for a married woman to be unloved. That violates God's order. Actually, it does. That is a tragedy that's wrong, but I don't believe that's what this proverb means, because it would not fit in context. In context, each one of these subjects here is someone who's usurping or overturning God's order, and they're the person at fault or, or being negative. So, for example, we've got the servant who betrays the king, the fool who prospers illegitimate, illegitimately. In a moment, we'll hear about the maid servant who displaces her mistress. Uh, and so here we have something about this woman. Literally, in the Hebrew, this is a hated woman who is married. And what it probably means is, is that this is a cruel, hateful woman who happens to be married and probably makes life miserable for her husband and miserable for just about everyone else around her. And the point of it is this, how unfitting it is for someone who doesn't seem to have love for anyone to be in that wonderful and amazing relationship of marriage, which was created by God, created by divine love, and was intended to be this ultimate place of love. How unfitting for someone who is very nearly incapable of love or who won't show it to be in that relationship. The earth trembles. And then finally, another the, the emphasis falls on the fourth point probably, although it's a little harder to see why here. It says, a maidservant who displaces her mistress. This describes a household servant who somehow takes the place of the wife perhaps stealing the husband's affections, maybe uh, by having an heir who takes the inheritance of the family. It's, these sort of things happened in the ancient world. This is another violation of that amazing and wonderful way that God has created human family and society to be structured. This is not the way it's supposed to be. You can imagine this would probably cause a scandal in the village or town they lived in. There would be damage to relationships. It would upset all sorts of people. Imagine how the children would grow up. It would be ugly. 
There'd be lots of brokenness, trauma. But this proverb emphasizes that this, yes, this, even this seemingly domestic issue behind closed doors causes the earth to tremble. I've read commentaries who think that this proverb is meant to be an exaggeration. Because aside from regime change, the first one, they think these situations hardly seem to threaten humans, the foundations of human society or the whole created order. This must be not serious. It's exaggeration. But I think that's actually exactly the point. The point of these proverbs is to say that those things, yes, especially that last one, that seems so small and ordinary, it's a story that's happened a thousand times, a million times, Millions of times in human history. Something so small and ordinary. A little domestic affair, trouble. That even that has massive cosmic and spiritual consequences. And maybe the proverb is saying, if the earth is trembling, so to speak, over this, maybe we should too. Now friends, or members of Arise, or visitors. I hope you know that God is good, that he created the eagle to soar. Beautiful, wonderful. And he created human beings to enjoy this creation, to live wonderful, peaceful, satisfied, eternal lives. That's what he created us for. God is good to us. And when we see that, and then we start to see the brokenness in this world and our role in it, do you start to see your own foolishness? Do you begin to see any of the ways in which maybe you have tried to bend, maybe even break God's designs? Yes, we know the world and our culture does that, but we're not the right people to picket and hold signs and shout at people out there in the world because we as Christians... Do we ever dishonor marriage or our spouses? Do we ever use sex or sexuality outside God's design? Do we harbor rebellion in our hearts toward authority? Do we ever cheat or try to get prosperity that we haven't properly earned, just like the fool with his full belly? Or maybe we just lack the wonder we should have. We feel proud and certain about our knowledge of the world. We live as though we don't need God's guidance. Under all of this, the earth trembles too. And those are the tremors of a coming judgment. But there is good news. The good news is that judgment isn't and is coming. It isn't coming for those who repent and turn back to God. God sent Jesus for us who were rebels and sick and broken. We have violated God's order and we are suffering because of it, but we couldn't possibly bear the judgment of God. So Jesus came and he suffered and died for our sins. He took that wrath and judgment, that earthquaking response of God's justice. And the Bible tells us that the earth actually did quake when Jesus died. The ultimate reversal of God's order. The truly innocent dying. God being murdered by his creatures. But God's ways are wonderful and mysterious. And his way offered forgiveness and a new opportunity to live the lives as we were meant to live. Jesus came and he proclaims a new restored creation. One that is turned right side up. And he invites sinners to repent and be reconciled to God and to join him in that new heavens and new earth. So judgment isn't coming for those of us who believe in Jesus. But there's also good news that judgment is coming. That one day God will finally rescue all of those who suffer under this upside down, unjust world. That God will remove those who keep breaking his designs and causing suffering and brutality in this world. We've been thinking a little bit about that over this past weekend, haven't we? There's genuine evil in this world. We need justice. But all of us really need mercy even more. But we look forward to God's justice too, that he will make everything right and new. 
So that's good news. It's good news that Jesus is coming, that there will be a restoration of God's order if you repent and turn to Jesus. So as we approach uh, the end of our series in Proverbs, two weeks from now, hopefully one final sermon, I regret that we haven't been able to consider all sorts of Proverbs on all kinds of topics. Parenting, money, lending, government, so much more. There's probably ones in there that you wish we had covered. But I believe this lesson on wonder, that there's a reason this book ends with this. That we may not, that wonder itself will help us better handle all those situations. We may not know everything, but we will humbly and reverently seek to listen to God in all those situations if we have wonder and awe and reverence at his created designs. We have the right spirit going in. We will learn and seek the advice we need in each of those situations. So my encouragement from God's word for all of us this morning is don't just aspire toward obedience. Don't just try to learn to do the right thing in this situation or that situation. I mean, that's probably good to do at a minimum. But it's even better to start with awe and wonder at God and his ways. Start with humility and gratitude. Start with the conviction that his ways are good even when we don't understand them. That wisdom of wonder will humbly receive salvation in Jesus, even if we don't fully understand how that works. That wisdom, will, that wonder will humbly seek God's guidance in all these areas of our lives. It's so important to humbly, reverently, and in awe follow God in everything we do in this world. Let's pray. Merciful God, we thank you for your word that you teach us what we need to know. And here at the end of Proverbs, we realize that you call us to look with wonder at you and your hand. That we don't always need to know everything. But we do need to worship and reverence you. And you will guide us. And you will care for us. And you will correct and teach and train us. So, Lord, with agar, we may say that uh, we don't have knowledge. That in so many ways it feels like we don't know the Holy One. But we are learning. We are learning in Jesus Christ what wisdom looks like. We are learning in Jesus Christ who you are, O God. We are learning that despite our broken world, that we have broken and torn down and tipped upside down with our own hands, That with your hands, you rescue us and are building a world set right side up. Thank you. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen.